I'm very pleased to have Kosha Anya Joubert with us today. She's Executive Director of the Global Eco Village Network. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, um, I want to ask you, what is an eco village? Um, I would, it's a point of inspiration, a place of regeneration, a place where people come together to find solutions to the problems we face. And we define an eco-village as a community that is created through participatory design in all four dimensions of sustainability, social, culture, ecology and economy for a regenerative future. We also say an eco-village is not an outcome, but a process. It's a path that you walk as a community or a traditional village. Many of our eco-villages are also existing traditional villages or an urban neighborhood, an urban community, a city. Um, you slowly start implementing the different eco-village principles. Mm. Could you just walk us through those principles very uh, quickly so we get um, a broad idea? Well, we have principles in each of the four dimensions. So say in, um, in the ecological dimension, the principles that we aim for, this doesn't mean that a community has to have implemented it fully in order to be recognized as an eco-village, but they need to show that it's their intention and that they are willing to walk there. So just to take ecology as an example, some of the principles are to use waste as a valuable resource and to recycle it. One principle is to regenerate the ecosystems that we are a part of and increase biodiversity. One principle is to use green architecture. One principle is around renewable energy and moving towards 100% renewable energy. One principle is around organic agriculture and protecting the soils. One is about replenishing the water sources. And I could name them also for the other dimensions, but those are the aims. Great, thank you. Uh, why are eco-villages important? You touched upon it, but why are well, they Well, I mean, it's a special time in which we live, and we all know this. Um, it's, uh, we've arrived in the Anthropocene, where as humans, we are co-creating the planet that we live on. Um, and at the moment, we have already destroyed a lot of the life systems that we depend on. We've lost around 40% of biodiversity in the past 50 years, um, or even a bit more now. Um, so it's quite radical. So just staying sustainable is no longer enough. We need to learn how to regenerate. We haven't even learned how to sustain it. So it's a big shift that we need to do. And um, Eco-villages started from people who became aware of this and said, we want to actually walk our talk in creating something different. And we have, in the eco-village movement, had many facets and many expressions of implementing local solutions to global challenges. And together, we now reach, around, reach out to around 10,000 communities around the planet. Together, all these local solutions are actually starting to have an impact. We see also over time that eco-villages in their regions and their countries start to have a, a, an outbreath of inspiration into the region around them and they start transforming the region around them. So over time, eco-villages really become seeds of transformation. Why, why would you say that Estonia or the Baltic region in general uh, is a good place for such a conference as the GEM? I mean, let me let me just speak to Estonia because I think Estonia is a is a special country in many different ways. One is that it's it's a small country. You manage to um, transform your country through a singing revolution, which means that there is a spark in the Estonian people, which can jump over, yeah. I also find that there's a huge love for nature in the Estonian culture, a huge love for forest. Um, also, it's still a very strong connection to tradition, a love for own tradition. 
um, hidden in the culture. And I think that some of, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know the experience that was here in the communist times. Um, I think that there was some beauty, but also a lot of trauma, a lot of very difficult experiences. Um, so I think there's some issues around village life, community life, that will also touch on those issues. But I also see this richness of um, potential around Estonia becoming an example of a country that stays true to its own roots, at the same time opens up to innovation, because we see a lot of very brilliant social entrepreneurship projects coming out of Estonia, while truly protecting their environment and living a life in social solidarity with each other. So we have the cultural roots, social solidarity, um, innovation in the economic arena, but also uh, an economy um, that is not based on selfishness, but also on sharing um, and this innovation and with the ecological restoration at the same time. I see that potential. And I also see that an eco-village development program, we had an interesting meeting here during the conferences where there were 10 different eco-village initiatives, but also the um, traditional village network of Estonia was represented. And we worked with the eco-village design cards to look at what are the strengths and the weaknesses of Estonian existing villages and um, the possibility of supporting them with the eco-village approach to transition to become more sustainable in all four dimensions. And there is huge interest, also interest of other countries like Scotland, Norway, Armenia, and other countries to actually collaborate with Estonia around this. So I see the possibility of Estonia becoming an example. Great. What does it take exactly to, to transform a traditional village into an eco-village? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we currently we've we've learned, you know, over the years coming from single working in single communities, we're now starting to work more in networks of communities in a country. So networks of traditional villages, and um, we usually we we start this work by an invitation that goes out to the villages and says, who is interested in this? And of course, in countries where there's a very rich history of eco-villages, we now find, for instance, in Denmark or Sweden, that the municipalities are longing for eco-village initiatives to come to them because they see the benefits that it has for their municipality. Um, but, you know, we start with where is their interest? We visit and share about best practice examples from around the world. What were other eco-villages in the world already able to do? You know, what are the inspiring solutions that Estonian eco-villages could integrate? We also look at the village and look at what are the strengths of this particular village? Like, what are they already doing in the four dimensions? And we find a lot of strengths. We also look at what are their needs? And together we assess what would be the leverage points for this particular village. Um, and from that we create a, a community development plan or an eco-village development plan or a village development plan. Um, and then we look for a collaboration with other NGOs, governments, local authorities to support the implementation of the plan. And we focus on technologies that can truly be owned by the community so that as much as possible local jobs are being created in this process. And as much as possible, the village is also um, networked with other communities, both in the country and beyond the borders of the country, because we find that a lot of strength and empowerment also comes from the from connection to other traditional villages in other places. We've already heard the Scottish communities are super interested in visiting the Estonian villages. And I think there's a lot actually to learn for villages from each other. Um, one of the most important issues uh, right now is how can we have economical sustainability in rural communities in Europe and elsewhere? As an eco-village designer yourself, how would you approach this question? 
Well, firstly, I want to say that we've already shown that it can be done. And, you know, I'll take as an example, like the Finthorn Foundation in Scotland. There was a, a study done that showed how much through flow, more through flow of money it brought to that whole region, the region of Mori. And it now has the highest concentrations of social entrepreneurships, startups around such a community in a rural area in the UK. So um, eco villages are engines for a local economy. So it's not um, just for middle class people from the city moving out into the countryside? That was the, the, um, the, the beginning seeds of the eco-village movement were often in middle class and today it's really clear we need a much bigger transition to happen and if people can't earn their living while making this transition it, it doesn't work. So we have a big focus on social entrepreneurship. I'll give one more example um, from Germany, the eco-village of Siemlinen, where I lived before. This is now the only village in that whole region that has increased inhabitants. You know, all the villages are emptying out. This village is, this municipality is now flowering. It has the highest percentage of children. It has many um, quite highly educated people also moving back to the countryside from the city and it is the only municipality in that whole region that has increasing employment opportunity so again the same the same result and how we do this in different ways um, one thing is that we have trainings so we work a lot with a very facilitative, facilitative and very experiential kind of training where people learn by doing, so very concrete training and also very much working with the potential that people have, that systems have, that place has and to connect to, to um, connect people also from different sectors. One important ingredient is to bring together the smartness of young people, like many villages have young youth that have moved to the city, or it can even be a generation of people who grew up in the city who are really hungry to move back to the countryside. But we would try and integrate that because there is a skill set there where if you can bring it together in a beautiful way, can create a creativity like the traditional knowledge that often the elders of the village bring. and. Um, the very special skills, you know, that might go from herbs for herbal remedies to um, special weaving techniques, you know, many different things. Bring that together with an intelligent design, the skills that are needed to work with IT properly, market properly. Um, also, we start often with eco-village branding instead of going like for 100% organic, which is often very hard and expensive to get, to use the eco-village branding to start selling the products. And these kind of combinations. So we always work with a concept of unity and diversity. So that diversity is very important to unleash creativity, looking at the potential that each element brings in the system and then bringing that into a, a, clever, a clever design. And we have very good results with that, yeah. How important is it to be self-sufficient uh, with food? Um, yeah, it used to be a, a, a very, very high... Um, goal of eco-villages and you know the localization of food is extremely important but I would never expect one village to be completely self-sufficient but within the region you know and it would be great to, to look at which village produces what you know maybe there's one village that really focuses on honey and one village that completely focus on a particular other um, product and then to have that exchange also between communities and villages because it creates networking and again that flow of creativity so we don't um, expect sufficiency within one eco-village but within a region and also um, Sometimes it can be very beautiful to export a particular product from that area to 
export culture and health also from a and also to import like coffee you know it's not likely you're going to be growing your coffee here but you can import it through fair trade from an eco village in somewhere else so support similar lifestyles somewhere else so very aware consumption where you um, do it yeah what would you say are the greatest strengths and also the biggest challenges uh, for eco villages or living in an eco village? Hmm. Um, I would say the greatest strength and the greatest challenge is rebuilding community because we come from a human past, not just in Estonia but around the world, where we have inflicted pain upon each other as human beings and we all come from that we also come from a past where often villages and communities were very tightly constructed and didn't allow for a lot of individual freedom and expression and today we're in a different time we're in a different time so um, the new eco villages um, need to create an empowerment of the individual really looking at what is the potential what is the gift that each individual brings. And I think the truly wise indigenous communities used to do that, you know, because only if the individuals can flower, the community can flower. And really to find what is the right place for each person within the whole. Give each person as much responsibility as they are willing and able to carry so that each person can grow in their leadership in different areas. We always have more than enough responsibility and leadership for everyone. And allow people to continue growing. Don't pull down your leaders, but support them to grow into even better leaders. And if we grow those kind of communities, it's inevitable that conflict and also um, sometimes past trauma will show up. And we need tools to work with that, to lose our fear of conflict and find out how, how is conflict a call for more fruitful win-win solutions? And how can we use conflict as a signpost that, ah, it needs an even better solution here. It's not a reason to separate, but a reason to find that way to spin up together and that's where so it's it's really it's the strength but it's also the challenge great thank you um as seen from the outside the this eco village lifestyle is often seen as uh, having a strong em emphasis on spirituality vegetarianism uh, and community um is this kind of is this lifestyle for everyone you think well firstly eco village does not need to be like that and not all eco-villages are. So, as I said before, we have the four dimensions and it doesn't matter where you start in those four dimensions. So spirituality in itself is not one of the eco-village principles. There is a principle that speaks to mindfulness and personal growth, um, which is about really learning to sense again the world around us. We have often hardened a bit not to and this makes us unable to respond adequately to the feedback that the world is giving us today so refining sensitivity is important over time but it doesn't matter where you start and we have i can give as an example the eco village of hurdal in norway this is really based on people saying we want to live in ecologically sound, healthy houses, and we want to feed our children healthy, organic food. And this is it. Yeah, that's what the community is based on. And that's enough to start with and to say, you know, this is an eco-village, yeah? Um, you do sign that, you know, as a, if you say, we want to transition to an eco-village, you sign up to, ah, these are very good aims. You know, and they're very directly related to the sustainable development goals. But where you start, how you start, and how much time you take is up to you. So, you know, there's a lot of studies that show that vegetarianism is a very strong um, impulse to reduce CO2 emissions. However, we have 
many, many eco-villages in our network, especially in Africa, where people absolutely eat meat, but they wouldn't necessarily choose the meat from the meat factories where animals are suffering and are filled with antibiotics. We would move away from that. But integrating a healthy animal husbandry um, and a caring way of interacting with animals in that way is a part of many of our eco-villages around the world. Just to take that fear away, yeah, it's, not, it's not a necessity, it's, it's part of a pathway and it's always contextualized and it, the decision is always with a community. It's a participatory design process. Eco-villages are not created by people who come from the outside. There's a pattern and it's the people in the village that decide what is most important for us as a community, as our next step, that is true to us. Um, to what extent is Eco-villages a brand? Well, it's not an official brand and we, by the time we thought about branding it, it was too late because it's already being used in many, many places. We've, you know, we, we thought actually of, um, anyway, so what we're doing at the moment, because we're seeing that the term eco-village, which for a long time people said, maybe you should change the word and call it sustainable communities or whatever, because it's still very often linked by people to hippie communities in the forest, you know, but it's, it's very professionalized at the moment. All the new eco-villages are created in close collaboration with the municipality, with the local authorities, very professional proposals, you know, so it's, it's uh, definitely something different. But we find that more and more the term eco-village is sometimes used by architects who want to coin and kind of ecological development as an eco-village because it sells the houses better. Um, and we are clear that if there is not a participatory design with the inhabitants, this is not an eco-village. Um, and what we're doing at the moment is we're developing or we have a, developed the first stage of an eco-village impact assessment, which again relates to the eco-village principles. There's a self-assessment that communities can do, working from a baseline study to see how well are we doing. And we're just now, by next summer it will be ready, we're working with several universities on a scientific eco-village impact assessment. And in a few years, this will lead to the fact that you will have eco-villages and certified eco-villages, which actually reach a certain standard in the scientific eco-village impact assessment. But this is kind of a branding, a second level of branding for the future. Great. What place do you think that technology has in, uh, in eco-villages now and in the near future? Well, technology is part of the expression of intelligence of us humans. So it has a core part, but also it's only one part of our intelligence. And many of the old traditions that people have and the old wisdom is also beautiful expressions of intelligence. At the moment, we're losing a lot of the traditional wisdom while a lot of new technology is bringing in. So we would like to balance that more and make sure we don't lose the sustainable traditions that really knew how to work with the plants around, how to understand the climate, how to understand the soil. There's a lot of wisdom in there that we don't want to lose. And sometimes technologies have been used in, or technologies can be used both in destructive ways and in regenerative ways. So we choose to use technologies in regenerative ways and also to become, um, to become very aware, how can technologies um, as much as possible be put in ownership of the villages? Because what we've seen often is that technologies are brought in that are so complex that they can't be repaired by the village or they can't be owned by the village. And as much as possible, we work with um, technologies that are truly able to be repaired in simple ways um, so they don't become a waste problem of the future or an unsustainable solution in the future. You know, like 
how can you work without batteries, you know, or work with batteries that don't create the problems that many batteries use. So we look at technology um, critically and we always speak about the importance to link innovation and tradition. Thank you. Um, what are the main advocacy activities and goals for GEN at the moment? Well, we're very active at the EU in Brussels, um, lobbying for uh, giving a space in policies to community-led development. And there are many studies now that show that not only community-led development gives a better return on investment, than more top-down development, but also that the impact of change is much bigger. Um, but in addition to the EU, we are very active at the UN. So GEN has consultative status with ECOSOC, but also with UNDP and, and UNEP is the eco-social forum of the United Nations, um, but it's also where the climate change conferences are hosted within this framework. So we've been very active at the climate conferences, the COP. Um, Paris, Marrakesh last year, it was in Bonn, um, this year it is in Poland, COP24. And we see quite a shift since the Paris Agreement um, has come into place. And governments have pledged to implement um, climate adaptation mitigation programs in their countries. And often they're at a loss as to how to do that. Governments have pledged to implement the sustainable development goals in their countries. And at the moment we see the gap between the pledges and the actual implementation on the ground grow. And as you see, it's so, eco-villages can be a part of the solution to this. Yeah, we're speaking to ministers, um, both at COP, and then we're being invited into countries. We're especially speaking about the eco-village development program, which is transitioning traditional villages to eco-villages, because it can scale up change processes very quickly in a country. And we have more and more countries where government support is coming together with these bottom-up movements. And um, we currently have 23 governments in the world that have expressed their interest in implementing an eco-village development program and we're slowly but surely following up. Because this is rather, we've been very surprised by the incredibly positive interest and response we've had. And we're now working quite strongly um, with Gen Education and Gen Consultancy to be able to respond to these um, to this interest. To give an example, I've just come back from Gen Armenia, where um, after the Velvet Revolution there, the new government is completely behind an eco-village development program. And we've just um, done the first trainings in the first three pilot eco-villages and are now planning for the next 10 pilot eco-villages. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting um, advocacy in that level where we also part of the eco-village development program is making a baseline study of what is already happening in the country but also of what are the laws and the policies that are in place what has the country pledged to do what are they actually doing and you know what what could the country what are the changes also in the legal frameworks that could be implemented to support such community-led development yeah talking about that what would you say are the are the biggest obstacles for this development? Uh... Hmm. It's, for sure it's different in each country. It's not the same. It really depends on the kind of government you have. Um, I think one big obstacle is that many governments have become very used to a top-down way of doing things. And that is also quite cemented into the, the bureaucracy and into the systems. So to... to um, like in Germany, we currently have a program where five eco-villages are working with five traditional eco-villages to transform them. And there's more and more traditional villages interested. But for traditional villages to even stand up and think, wow, you know, we could design our own pathway into the future. And for the mayors to wake up to that, instead of thinking that they're needing to follow the programs coming from the region, and then co-creating, you know, the local action plans, co-creating that with the sustainable development plans for the region and the country, so that the local level, you know, we, we 
we're actually part of the participatory democracy movement. Because in a way we're, we're saying, you know, bring back, believe in your people, believe in the good intentions of your citizens and work with them. Believe in the intelligence of your citizens and allow them to co-create, to bring their wisdom up from the ground and also to start co-creating the system. So not every government is interested in that, yeah. That is definitely an obstacle, but it can be an incredible driving force for a country that is wanting to set an example in sustainable development, to do this kind of collaboration. Yeah. How can eco-villages be part of the solution for the economical and ecological challenges that we face at the moment? Well, eco-villages are places where people walk their talk in implementing solutions. And that's the first and simple answer, because it's where people are actually doing it instead of just speaking it. Um, and a part of that is finding new ways of doing economy where anything I, any resources I use, I create them in a way that heal the ecosystems at the same time. When I work with people, I work with them in a way that supports their personal growth. Yeah? And the products I create have a healing impulse back into society. And that's a very simple step-by-step -step process where eco-villages can become a backbone of a thriving bioeconomy or a new economy that actually heals instead of destroys. And we see that e every eco-village in the world um, very quickly becomes a hub of inspiration for their region and their country, a place where sustainable or education for sustainability is delivered in very practical and concrete experiential ways. Thank you very much.